So, Sam, you got yourself a new job at the movie theater. Uh, do you think there's any hope for another D and D movie so you could get like a some like those dice buckets that they had last time? I mean, the dice buckets were pretty cool. Uh, but I I don't know. I wasn't like that big of a fan of the movie. No. Yeah, you know I what? Was I, okay. I thought it was a fun little romp, but I, I lost the immersion the moment like uh, everyone dove into the gelatinous cube and then like they still had clothes afterwards. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> I don't I didn't know you could part. dive into a gelatinous cube. Like I haven't seen the movie yet, but I I always thought that they were more of like a as weird as the analogy is, but the uh, the Jello cubes from like those all you can eat restaurants. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, like, they have a good surface tension. That's a good yeah. point. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like if you uh, – so maybe you couldn't really – Well, they did a bit of a kind of like a hands first, almost like a pencil dive. So, like, maybe. Maybe. But, like, getting if you, out would be really hard. I, I, I don't think you could belly flop. I think it's I think it's more like, surface tension a bit. Than to get out. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Because, like, uh, it's just – it's jello. It, yeah. I think they had like a family guy bit that basically applies like exactly what you're dealing with. Gelatinous cube is just this big old jello monster. Like, well, what you going to yeah. do? I'm pretty sure I did an episode on it. Uh, we did a while back, but I think uh, the, the takeaway there was that they're perfect for like a spa day. Like you stick your feet in, kind of like get all the calluses, <laughs> like a, remove a good layer of skin, come out and mm, squeeze. Very short talk. Yeah, you know, kind of mix that in there. Women all over Faye Rune love that shit. <laughs> Put a black pudding in the, soaps, the mud mask. Shampoos. <laughs> Uh, have you seen the I, what? I don't know what the Japanese name for it is, but uh, it's really big on Netflix now. Delicious in Dungeon. I haven't yet, but it looks really good. I haven't even seen that. I don't think it's come across my feed on well Netflix. If you're looking for some DM inspiration, I highly recommend it because they this party they they go in. They're like, okay, we gotta rest. We gotta go in. Like, get our healer that was eaten by a dragon resurrect this bitch but we we don't have money for food so we're just gonna live off the dungeon the dungeon will provide it, it, are there mimics we'll eat them uh, are are there little goblin things maybe we'll eat those too uh, <laughs> i mean that i mean looking at it like logistically that's one way to make sure you don't have to carry travel rations i mean you gotta have to make camp every night anyway Hey, yeah, it's just like survive. living off the dungeon and just uh, the dwarf in the show uh, at this point that I'm watching, like not much of a spoiler. He's using an adamantine pot for cooking. So it's just mm -hmm. like, OK, cool. So it was a shield, but he didn't have much use for a shield. So n now it's a pot. And like the, the lore for that is, OK, well, adamantine heats very evenly, very good for cooking. OK. I guess before we get too much into other anime, <laughs> we should probably start the show. Uh, I would think so. shows the talk show that brings you monsters news and home brews and hopefully a little something delicious from that dungeon and uh, i'm a little disappointed on the popcorn side i am your host orion i am your host sam with the broken voice of thunder <laughs> well I, I wish i could help you with that but you know my cough drops are in my house and not yours so that there's a distance gap have you just tried gargling them? <laughs> what you do is just like get like a whole bunch of them, just kind of like just swish them around, add a little water. Just... <laughs> mm. 
<laughs> so if someone in the party gets a cold, you're just going to give them like a little gelatinous cube uh, jello to, to soothe that throat. Uh, they got to be they got to be edible in some way. Like I, I was watching that show the other day uh, and like they were talking about the biology of slimes and how like you can't really see their organs, but like uh, once you actually like open them up like they do have organs. So, so it's like it's interesting like they have like a whole digestive tract yeah yeah that's actually exactly how it's described i've never thought of it like that so 80 percent slurpable <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, four out of five animals agree. agree. <laughs> ten out of ten would slurp. <laughs> oh, damn. As you can see, Sam, I, I am joined with Plank this week. I, I moved my bookshelf, so he's got a good plot, good spot to sit for the show. Nice, nice. Our proper, like, stage manager. Well, you know, someone's got to make that big podcasting penny. But, you know, speaking of podcasting pennies, we have a guest that we failed to introduce this week. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, sir? My name is Dan. Uh, I am Dan the GM. I am the creator, editor, producer, and head GM of a show called What the Dice. Uh, we are three years running, three and a half years running. Uh, we January 1st was our three year, so three years, three months, I guess. Um, we did a homebrew Pathfinder uh, in a custom world, and uh, ah, we'll nice. be—we're actually going to carry that homebrew world into our season two. I, I like that. That creates a whole continuity. Cool. You mm -hmm. know, it, it's pretty smart doing the whole starting in January. And I might be biased because we did basically the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> So when you start the new year, it's like, oh, you don't even have to think about it. You're just like, new year, boom, the, the podcast has been going for X number of years because boom. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's just that simple, you know? <laughs> it, you just got to remove the whole, like, forgetting an anniversary. I got I got to, if I'm going to forget an anniversary, I have a wife for that. <laughs> 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 well you know that it does have a, a toll on my life expectancy but you know. <laughs> it's true <laughs> that, that's how it goes that's what all the like that's what the internet is for you program it in once and it will remind you yeah true. the future <laughs> yeah i got plank to handle my calendar <laughs> <laughs> now i actually got this D, D calendar that my uh, stepfather got me that's just kind of like hanging behind <laughs> probably yeah we actually recently started a D, &D actual play po podcast type thing ourselves like i feel weird referring to like a, a campaign as a podcast though it, yeah it's that's one of the things that I got used to and had to kind of force myself to is when I started the show, I referred to, I stopped referring it to a campaign and more of like our season because of the way we designed it. Mm. Um, yeah, we, uh, when we designed, when I wrote this, the first season up, it was, I didn't do what some podcasts do where it's like, you know, your season is like sections of the story. Uh, our first season is 176 episodes, <laughs> 175 episodes, not counting any bonus episodes that we released. Right. I do like bonus episodes. Those are always cool when a podcast does that. But I have mm -hmm. to ask, how long is an episode if you got that many? <laughs> Our episodes, uh, once we got into a, a rhythm, our episodes tend to be about an hour long. Ah, 
that's actually very digestible. The first po- D&D podcast I got into, Tabletop Escapades, had about one hour long episodes. So they'd be like, mm-hmm. okay, you do a session, you chop that up into like three episodes, and then mm-hmm. like you got regular weekly content that way. And yep. it's very functional. It keeps up with the demand without being overwhelming like a show, uh, like say Critical Role, top of the line when it comes to D&D podcasting. But a lot of people find just the sheer amount of it just overwhelming in every conceivable well my thing is it makes it hard so we did it to where we're a little bit more um player friendly because that means that i can give our team breaks top and bottom of the hours to give thing to give them a chance to you know get up walk around because sitting for four hours in front of a computer can be hard when you're doing tabletop because there's so much you got to do so we broke it up that way and i went well if i'm already breaking it up i'll just stop the recordings and that makes my episodes and we record twice a month or every other week so we get two months worth of episodes in a go yeah that that makes a lot of sense, and I believe that's how Easy Allies uh, did their stuff for uh, tabletop escapades and tabletop adventures, which I started listening to them back in what was it twenty fifteen? Wow, that was like the early days of D anD D podcasting. Yeah, it was. It's a- yeah, I didn't get into listening to podcasts until oh twenty. 2020 2019 something like that that sounds what? about right that's when a lot of people started getting into podcasts and things of that nature mm-hmm. like for me it was just a matter of i'm working my jobs are i've always gone for jobs that were a little bit more flexible in allowing me to be able to listen to something mm-hmm. uh, when i worked at a yeah, hospital probably the same like, for me. I, I would just hang this tiny ass speaker from my collar and just mm-hmm. listen to it like that it's like okay no one can bitch about me having earbuds in no earbuds and i did mm-hmm. get ratted out for earbuds without ever having them <laughs> yeah what got me into podcasting was i was working for a uh, event company oh yeah with my degree with theater i got a job with this event company and there was a lot of days where you're just in a warehouse cleaning detailing mm-hmm. pulling yes. product And the rule was you were allowed one earbud in. Well, because Mm. some of the music I listen to uses both the right and left channels separately, Ah, it makes it really hard to hear. So when I started listening to podcasts, which one of the guys actually got that I worked with got me hooked onto Adventure Zone, was the very first Mm. podcast I got into. Um, I started listening to that. And from there, I actually found others. Uh, So I went... Adventure Zone, Glass Cannon, Resting Glitch Face, and then Opti's <laughs> show. If you don't know who Opti is, he's the he's kind of like the father of the Shadowrun podcasts. Yeah, um, just... uh, I'm not familiar with it, but like that last one, like uh, Resting Glitch Face, like that is prime naming right there. Just mm, mm-hmm. chef's kisses they, all day. They are an amazing podcast, and I've met – I've not met them in person. I actually interviewed them uh, for our season or our year three anniversary. I actually got to hang out and chat with a couple of their creators, and they are amazing women. Uh, it's a all-female cast. Their GM oh, wow. is male. Uh, but they they took Shadowrun in a very different kind of feel. They have this moniker of the uh, – what is it? it is, they are the Gilmore Girls of Shadowrun, and they hold I, true I love to it. that. I fucking like, love it. it. Like Shadowrun is all about those missions, and they throw that out. Like it's the no, nah, yeah, okay, yeah, the missions are there. They're doing them, but they are not the, the, the story. Like the, the <laughs> chaos that these girls go through is just absolutely amazing, and the glitches are amazing podcasters. Hmm. I, I I like that because like. Yeah. Some it really comes down to just having a good crew to put together a podcast like that. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, at the end of the day, like when you want to have a good tabletop experience on its own, a, as a DM, it's not enough to simply okay, we're putting friends at the table. Sometimes you do kind of have to curate things in the sense of okay, what players can I put at a table that will like just mesh well 
like get mm-hmm. that really good like player chemistry like how am i concocting this like you know yeah uh <laughs> Definitely is that's one way to look at it. The uh the way I did it for season three. So I have two returning players. Uh the my wife who plays Kalila in season one, Nightland, and a friend of ours named Ethan, who plays Defibulous Short Round in season one, are returning for season two. That's a my fantastic other, name. <laughs> yeah. My other three players. One is a, another GM that has uh gamed with us or gamed with my wife a couple of times. Mm-hmm. The uh, Jared, Lyle, they are LARPers, like they travel and do LARPing, they're joining us and I am literally bringing in and this is something I never thought I would do, but it really felt right, is I'm bringing in a friend of mine who has never been on a tabletop before. Okay, This is not only his first tabletop but it is his first podcast and he has nice. never rolled dice before and he is joining me in Shadowrun 5th edition, which is a very complicated, convoluted, <laughs> rules-heavy game that I have morphed and we have we I, I'm paying for a couple of things to help everyone have easier roles and stuff like that. Yeah. Right. So no, I get what you're saying because like I don't understand why it works. Like mm-hmm. just every time I've seen it done. A new player, completely fresh, never touched a tabletop, will get brought into a group, and it'll typically be put on a podcast. Like uh, the Unexpectables did it. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see, uh, it was done with uh, a few other podcasts that I've listened to, and every time that it's been done, I, I think uh, even I believe they did it with the One Piece D and D with uh, that Daniel Rustage runs, and every time I've seen it done. It just works like the people that have no experience with tabletops just take to it like a fish to water. Like they just mm-hmm. they it clicks perfectly. And I, I think it's because they also don't have that. And, and this is something that I, I stand that uh, I don't know how to explain. Um, everyone has those bad GMs mm. and the people who are willing to put someone new on a show they have to have themselves at a different level of patience to have rules prepped and know that there's going to be just a lot more extra work because you're also curating the show, but you're helping someone grow. It takes a different type of GM. It it really does. So. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'd like to say I am still a forever GM, but uh, I I actually am not anymore. Um, I'm not sure who I spoke to on the Twitterverse, but I had made the comment of there was something I wanted to announce. Yeah. So there's another podcast that I, that I am friends with. Uh, a gentleman named Doc Friendship is one of the curators with it called Sinless. It's um, oh. They are a Shadowrun show. And they do that and then Shadow Running on Empty, which is a, a their lore show. Well, for their main show, which is Sinless, I am actually joining their main cast as a permanent okay. player. Oh, that sounds awesome. So nice. I am going to be a not forever GM anymore. <laughs> and uh, Breaking they, free. I, breaking free, which is absolutely uh, – is, is so much fun. I'm playing a uh, – a troll that is a pacifist. Okay. That is ah. a melee specialist. So it's going to be a lot of like, stop making me hurt you jokes. Oh, wow. <laughs> Just walks up and aggressively hugs somebody. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, you, you got to look at it differently, but they're doing, I think they said that they might be changing the edition they're running, but I'm excited. I get to join a show that I am actually amazing. That It's like when they asked me, I was flabbergasted that they asked me because I didn't know if they listened to the show or not. Like it, it's, it's weird. Like you, you see numbers and you're like, Oh, that's cool. People are watching. Yeah. Who are these people? That sounds like such a fun experience. Oh man. Yeah. Like, that's Honestly, so it's, it is surreal. Cause like, uh, we haven't been podcasting nearly as long as you have, but like, uh, we still just kind of get like, you'll see people in your audience and it's just like mm-hmm. that the imposter syndrome just doesn't seem to like go away. Cause it's like, mm-hmm. Oh, well th- there's people there, but 
You, you got to be lying. You're not actually watching <laughs> any of this. You want to know what's even weirder? If you ever go to a con, my wife and I, Nightland and I have started going to cons in our area. And we have gone to two cons where people have recognized us. Holy shit. <laughs> And, and like have walked up and they're like you're what the dice and i'm like we are who are you <laughs> and it's so it's like it's such a surreal thing and it's amazing like i love the fact that you know we have a, we have a discord and stuff like that and it's it's so much fun to chat with people and like i don't even like if they listen to the show great if they have fan theories great but you know honestly just Getting to talk to people about their experiences as a in the tabletop community is just interesting because you can get all sorts of cool ideas out of people. Oh, yeah. It's one of the things that we love about this show. Like every time we have someone come on the show, it's just like, let's come up with the most toxic, fun ideas to throw at your players. That'll just make them be like, why? Why did you come up with this? I love it, but I fucking hate it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's one of the things is that's how I've come up with some of our arcs. Uh, we did a an arc that was I, – I found a way to kind of blend it into the lore of the show, like the main story. But the entire – the entire arc was based around Nightland going, hey, I want to – I just want to kick around side mission job. Like, I don't want to, I, I don't, I want something to kind of rest my brain on everything else. So I wrote up right. this idea of, okay, what is a side quest w really? And uh, between Nightland and I, we came up with the thing of like, side quests are red herrings. Like, <laughs> you don't know what you're going to deal with. And it's just a non-sequential, run over here and go do this thing. Yeah. So True. We, we, we literally made a fish temple. Uh, the red herring. Okay, yep. okay. <laughs> yep. I, I love it. Fantastic. It ended up turning out really well. Like, one of the players got high on leech venom. There was toxic <laughs> spores. Like, it was it was a trip and a half to record. Mm. I bet. That, like, that's just... Getting high on leech venom just sounds hilarious to me. Like it kind of yeah. reminds me of this one session I ran where the the party was at a, a village that they had. Uh, it was kind of like a home base for a while. And there was like this big celebration going on. And like this guy from the Druids past comes back and he's just like this super chill, like Snoop Dogg uh, kind of sounding <laughs> satyr. <laughs> so <laughs> he rolls into the town. The the one of the players had secretly murdered like the mayor. So now Snoop Dogg, uh, the Snoop Dogg Seder, uh dude's just like, oh, yo, the, the, the widow looks like she could use some company tonight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, wow. it, it was hilarious. Um, That's great. It was it was fantastic. Mildly hits on uh, the female party members when all rejected by all of them. You know what? There's a widow over there. I'm going for that. <laughs> so they were. You said they were a druid. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like That's uh, the, that feels like a bard thing to do. Like not necessarily a druid way to go, but I mean, well, yeah, yeah. Like uh, we did have a bard in the party at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a. I was kind of playing around with letting people uh, use like custom lineage to be half of one race and half of another. Which, okay. And my brother decided that it'd be cool to go with half goblin, half tiefling. So just this little green tiefling looking goblin with the horns and the tail. And <laughs> that hurts my head. <laughs> uh mikhail was not a very lucky person <laughs> despite <laughs> having I, I let my brother take the lucky feet twice because he had so many close calls with death <laughs> that he needed it <laughs> he, he ultimately had to retire the character because he just didn't feel safe running him <laughs> oh wow wow yeah it it was something else yeah. 
But that that's something that I, I found kind of fun with the whole uh, custom lineage. Like if you just like let people start mixing things, like mm-hmm. it, it gets wild real quick. Because realistically, yeah. tiefling, just as an example, is just one of those things where it, someone in your family fucked a devil. So it it's pretty yeah. compatible with most races in theory. Mm-hmm. Uh, same with Asimar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, hold on, let's push that a little bit back. And <laughs> He's not ready yet. But you know what? Ready, like... Oh, we, we got news. This is TNF, bringing you nerd news. All right, Sam. I so love hearing that. <laughs> I know, right? So, you know, Con has unveiled the D and Grip. Flavored converts. Flavored. Uh, I mean, if that's what you can call it, uh, they don't really. Okay, so that one looks. I'm gonna have to pull some of this up on stream, actually. Yeah, yeah, pull it up so we can see. Yeah, let me just uh, do the thing here. There we go. There. It looks kind of neat, like a. Not the most impressive of designs, but like, you know, just a little bit of some wizard looking dude, kind of a boss looking guy. See, they're not really. Okay, that's got the little D&D logo, but I've never been much of a Converse fan. Like, I think they're neat. And like, I had fun convincing uh, one of my buddies to wear them like a homeless dude by like stuffing the tongue underneath his uh, foot because like the shoes didn't fit so he just laced everything up over like the skin of his foot i mean i think they look okay i guess kind of yeah like the dragon one yeah there's like the, the gelatinous cube with like the converse logo in it for a t-shirt that that's kind of neat i don't <sighs> think there's really all that much that you can realistically do with the with all that branding and converse, but like, it's, not, it's whatever. It's neat that they were trying to go for something. Clearly, the uh, person that wrote this article for Wargamer was like underwhelmed. <laughs> it looks like a cash grab and like. What can you say? I mean, if you like your D&D merch, that's whatever. But, like, if I wanted some D&D Converse, I probably could have just asked my brother to make some Converse. You know, like, w- you, we all know that one guy that's, like, way too into Converse. So they just, <laughs> yeah, if you have that one Converse friend, just be like, yeah. hey, make me a pair. <laughs> Their merch is so fly. <laughs> they do have that merch i mean like i'm not too much for that kind of stuff because like i don't have money <laughs> <laughs> you know a man can dream once in a while but moving Some... into other bits of our nerd news the uh the De- Wizards of the Coast has recently announced the quests from the Infinite Staircase, which uh, they kind of put some details up on it this past week. It's going to be featuring six remastered adventures from uh, various uh, things that have been released over the years. Some of them uh, from like the early TSR days with Gary Gygax and uh, whatnot. So it's like, okay, going to see some classic dungeons and stuff brought back. And it looks like the level range for these adventures is between 1 to 13. And a lot of it is, a lot of the narrative seems to revolve around aiding uh, Nafis, the, a genie, in granting wishes across the infinite staircase. So basically a lot of little plug and play kind of uh, adventure modules to do with as you see fit. Uh, I kind of like having these kind of modules on my shelf just because like, when you need something to bastardize because you don't have 
the most uh, creative prep time. Like, okay, I, I'll just take this adventure. Mm, let me just take a pen and ruin this book real quick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, those those pre-written short books are always nice for people who want to get their feet wet at, as GMing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, they're fantastic for that for. Well, one of the main things that I find is that if you have one of those books that's like, hey, bunch of one shot adventures, then you can kind of like build the pacing for designing your own one shot off of the mm -hmm. off of using those as a template. Mm -hmm. Like I kind of uh, I've used them before, but I always find myself just like, OK, it, it's a it's a format for an adventure everything's going off the rails almost immediately <laughs> as you do i can't remember the last time i ran a ran a, a campaign out of a book the the people <laughs> i game with like the minute the game starts the rails are gone so mm. i'm just like all right we're, we'll play it off the hip I think the last one I ran successfully by the by a book was uh, the Acquisitions Incorporated one, which is a lot of people have a lot of criticism for. But I love the uh, the faction and the home base mechanics that are baked into it. Like, OK, we, we got a home base and, and now our home base has weapons and we can upgrade it and it uh, scales to uh, the tier of play that we're at. Like, okay, that, that's cool. I like that. Yeah, that's definitely a different way to do things. And it also kind of like keeps the story going by like, oh, well, uh, you guys are working for a company. So as a result, they, that company will just give you uh, quest requests. Like, okay, uh, here's a bunch of things. Take the one you want and uh, go get that money. A and yeah. we're taking a cut. <laughs> <laughs> Gig mentality, man. Gig mentality. Yeah, like it, it really just kind of removed some of the go and get the quest uh, portions of it so that people mm -hmm. can just kind of get to the questing part of it. Feels but, very stolen from Shadowrun because that's kind of like what you do. I feel like it would depend on my mood that day because it's one of those things of like, if you want to like, I mean, think about it. You've say you've been yeah. and like done three dungeon crawls. It's like, you know what? I need money. Yeah. Go collect six mushrooms. All right. That'll take me a couple hours, but you know, <laughs> I would never take an escort mission. Oh, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> <Those are> traps. <laughs> <laughs> the trick to escort missions is to like have uh, one person, well, well, not one person, but like a, just just have a scout up ahead, and then a sweeper behind, and then like mm -hmm. a, you know some people with uh, whatever you're escorting, because like if you're aware of what's going on up ahead and you got a sweeper, like no one ever uses a sweeper. Look, which, people uh, always pay a lot for escort missions. <laughs> It kind of makes me think of this one escort mission from an anime I watched called Desert Punk, where oh, I remember that anime. I've got a copy of it. Uh, Desert Punk is criminally underrated. Fantastic. If you, if anyone wants some inspiration to run a desert wasteland type campaign, ten out of ten recommend Desert Punk. And uh, they had. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I gave Shangri La a chance. I, I think it's all right, but the uh, with the uh, desert punk, they had an escort mission, and they're like, "Okay, we're sending out a bunch of these. Uh, you guys are with the real deal." And so no trash game. You, you, you tell them that they're uh, with the real thing, and the rest are decoys. Meanwhile, the main party is actually with the decoy, and all they're protecting is just like a, these transport vehicles that are full of like 
literal shit because like in a way <laughs> like manure is actually extremely valuable yeah it makes sense which is why having your uh, players guard a shipment of shit is hilarious yeah <laughs> we are guarding a metric fuck ton of shit <laughs> but it pays well um, <laughs> <laughs> more or less what it's what it's like <laughs> it, it it is it is but yeah. i i yeah. sorry I, I was gonna say uh dan do you have any like like a favorite homebrew that you like to kind of like use consistently so yes and no so there is one thing that I've used that Nightland, my wife, absolutely adores. And it's an older, before we did podcasting, uh, we were running a Star Wars second edition, first edition. Oh, wow. Like, it was the D20 system. So it's old. Um, before the Galactic edition came out. Hmm. I created this, if you know anything about star wars lore there's this weird gap in technology it goes from slug right. throwers to blasters to disruptors and there's mm. not really anything in between yeah because like in between would be the kind of technology kinetic uh, technology that we know mm -hmm. for like a you know our, our society so yeah. like they kind of tried to avoid that when mm -hmm. it came to star wars as a setting which i think was a good choice by lucas because like Right, but <laughs> there's no explanation of the jumps. And so what I did is I created this homebrewed work company um, called Helix Core, which is this, like, mysterious think, think portal. <laughs> okay, okay. I created Portal in Star Wars, and I also found a way to actually, like, explain Force Crystals. I made a droid for Force-sensitive via, like homebrew magic um so hmm. i kind of started doing this like mystery or shadow company government kind of thing that i've started to do and in our actual season they actually make an appearance but they've been changed uh, if you know anything about like scp or anything like that oh, oh the that's institute <laughs> yep, the institute of extraplanar studies is what we call them. And their whole existence in season one was trying to understand where this forgotten God had appeared and how to deal with him. And they are, and if you really pay attention to the way it's being built, it's definitely being built into like that MIB SCP kind of feel mm. um, as they grow, because it's the, they're finding all this old strange technology they're finding all these books and they're they're capturing creatures to understand how they work. Even to the point of they capture mimics to understand how mimics are reproducing and how they're able to hide themselves. So this whole right. like shadow government company thing has become kind of a fun thing I play with for my, my homebrew stuff. Makes sense. <laughs> I, I figured you would. You, you are the resident evil. Yeah, so uh, we have it, season two. They're they're going to be in again, uh, and we're actually creating. So you have the Institute of Extraplanar Studies, and then you have the oh, what is it? The Extraplanar Defense Force, or something like that, which Ooh, is their that, counter of the like yeah, that, one that, wants to study, the other wants to destroy, hmm. um, and they are actually built into the lore, like their whole existence is why what happens in season two happens in season two. I, I like that kind of buildup, you know, mm -hmm. I'll have to figure out how we're going to handle seasons and stuff for what we're doing. Cause like we're maybe like just like overarching, like, cause uh, in, I don't know how familiar you are with one piece, but like uh, we're starting our crew off in the North blue, which is like a more technologically uh, built uh, area of the one piece world. And mm -hmm. 
one of their big goals is to eventually work their way into the grand line. So that that'd be like a whole other kettle of fish entirely. Mm-hmm. So maybe that'd be um, a good way to div- divide it. Yeah, I mean, some people divide it based on your. I guess you would. Call, it, it's almost like how um, Avatar did it, where you have books. Mm. So. If you are dealing with just the firelands, like how they did it, you had the water, the earth, the fire, those were kind of the, some people break it up like that for seasons. Um, The way I did it was when I changed stories. So when I change systems or stories, that's when the new season starts because I don't want to have seasons interblend like that. No, that makes 100% sense because I've seen that done with other uh, podcasts and it's like, okay. That that is end of an era, moving on to the next. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's kind of how I did my uh, third column paper. You know, like this is the end of the arc. Then we're moving into the next like segment of the story. Yeah. I look forward to seeing where that goes because I really like playing Esra. Absolutely. All right, Sam. So how the how the monsters doing? <laughs> so today I've I've talked about you know one monster, two really not that special i got the mephit menagerie all right there are a lot of these guys <laughs> uh, i should say so like uh aren't methods so just like the the basic imp like creature that are assigned to like every elemental plane exactly and if you you know go listen to our recent episode of a banjo with elemental planes kind of stuff we were talking about the goon and the Yeah, lots of elementals. Yeah, so I've been looking through the, you know, some of the creatures that live there, and I was like, "Ooh, methods are interesting." And then I saw how many uh, yeah. variations there are, what they can do. They're everywhere. Like they are in every plane, every para every para elemental plane, every quasi plane, and you know, their variety. Of Comparable to each plane in itself. And I love the planes and I like the fight. <laughs> so, right. Methods were extra planar outsider creatures, similar to imps. Uh, outsiders were any non elemental creatures that originally are in other in the prime material. So, methods were roughly humanoid in appearance and somewhat small, approximately four feet tall by two meters in height. Okay, so they're like child sized. Yeah, pretty much. Um, and they had the, like their bodies were exactly, you know, representation of their elements. You know, the dust one is like a sand man. Right. <laughs> Magma is like a, you know, lava rock. Lava. Okay. The exact disposition of methods depended on their plane of origin, though they were universally capricious tricksters and rarely endearing. Took great pleasure in being pests, displaying tendencies towards vulgar behavior. So just like imps, they were uh, by no means inherently evil, and in fact were highly impressionable, always eager to please their masters and shifting alignment to better do so. Their habit, your ha- their habit of making mischief, simply made them more inclined to serve evil doers, becoming sadistic, vindictive, and malicious. Uh, so already I'm sold on recruiting methods with the next time I'm in one of your games because <laughs> like, Esra is like elementally charged. Yeah. She's building up all the this weird elemental primal these, stuff. These so kind of the low the, level spirits that, you know, they would be perfect would little be. minions, you know, build up my feels, entourage. It almost feels like the the minions from the Overlord games. Oh, yeah, yeah kind of. because you have the different elements and that they're mostly mischievous rather than actually like mm-hmm. outwardly evil. 
Yeah, and I, I just love the concept of like you pick a elemental plane or a sub elemental plane, boom, there is a method for that. So you got mud, dust, mineral, ice, magma, fire. Like, yep. uh, and I do have a list of uh, from all of them and the planes that they come from. So, yeah, I'll yeah, run through that real quick. So we got the main ones earth, water, fire, and air. And we got ooze, uh, smoke, ice, and magma. I, I like the ooze. Because yeah, yeah ooze is just cool. like a little booger imp. And then we have the positive <laughs> and negative quasi elemental planes with lightning, radiant, mineral, and steam. And then we have void, ash, dust, and salt. What does a void method do? That, that's what that I want. That's my favorite. Because <laughs> that just sounds cool. And then you have like the positive uh, plane. So it's like, this is just a, a method made of pure radiance? Yeah. My brain got stuck on the salt one. Honestly. <laughs> yeah, like, oh, I, boy. I, I was <laughs> trying not to, but like, how can you not? Yeah. Because everything else makes sense. And then it's the salt. And it's like, but salt's a mineral. That's what isn't I would think it? too, right? Uh, <laughs> but well, it's a it's a mix of the water and negative uh, elements, which That's is weird. interesting. Hello, Where I am mineral the, is earth. And I positive. am the imp of sodium chloride. <laughs> yeah. Here to give you high blood pressure. <laughs> I run our, my mischievous deeds include going up to people and over seasoning their food and what well, then pissing them off so their blood pressure reaches new heights. <laughs> That's an NPC that writes itself. They're You're terror welcome. of the elderly. Fear <laughs> of the elderly. Oh my god. So each type of method had some form of breath weapon, which could usually do minor elemental damage, though it was mostly intended to ward off would-be attackers. <laughs> Mephit's combat abilities greatly varied from one type to another, but their most basic attacks consisted of clawing and biting. For example, an earth mephit could soften earth and stone, whilst a fire mephit could heat metal. Uh, in order to aid each other in combat, they could summon each other. Following this, they may have attacked in a swarm of multiple methods and could have uh, quick regeneration abilities. So, so I was looking at kind of the stats oh, of them, and they do vary slightly. Um, where something like the Void Method has a strength of 11, you know, the Magma has an 8, and a Steam has a 5, you know. So okay. you can kind of imagine what you're dealing with here. Yeah, like, I can see how it would vary based on the element, but for the most yeah. part, like, just a standard method stat, stat block is good enough. Mm -hmm. And when, it seems like they all have the death burst ability. You know, when the method dies, it explodes in whatever element. Each creature within five feet must make a dexterity 11 saving throw, taking 2d6 element damage on a failed save for half as much on a success. I abuse that shit in Baldur's Gate. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just like. Oh, I wish no. they'd let me summon something other than just ice methods in that game, just because like there's so many methods, and I'm just like, oh yeah, sure, I I, I get the ice ones because yeah, exactly. And then you know all of them have false appearance, and they kind of just look like a mound or a clump of whatever element they are. They could just look like a clump. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the ash and dust one might look a little, or the ooze one, oof. <laughs> just a little you, polish. You shit. thought it was a slime, but it was actually a method. <laughs> Who shit on this ground? Oh god, it's a method. <laughs> <laughs> I have so much more appreciation for these things now. <laughs> oh and they do each have you know an innate ability spell that goes with their. Uh, you know, their element. Like, magma has heat metal, steam has blur. Okay. That makes sense. Salt has overseason. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Salt's gotta be, like, by far the one of the best ones here. <laughs> yeah, like, I was sitting there thinking, like, you know how you were saying, you know, they have claw and bite attacks. I'm like, okay, you know, I could see how, like, the fire would hurt, void would hurt, but I'm like, 
Salt would probably be the most insulting because it's like you take the damage and then it's like it burns afterwards. It's not actually doing any extra damage. It's just hurts. It's the most irritating one. Maybe it's like a poison. Yeah. <laughs> you could get blinded by its salt breath. Oh, so yeah. Salt in your eyes. Oh, That's the like dust it. one would be the worst. <laughs> no, no, no. Because the, you get salt like uh, like just like really like right there like sure your eyes might have like a natural saltiness but not that much like this is fundamentally very different (laughs) what's also really interesting is apparently mefe guano was a substance which possessed some magical properties it could be used to enchant items and if thrown exploded in a deadly stinking cloud so carrying such items was frowned upon and their stench was surely to scare people away so i can carry the salt shit and throw it at people. <laughs> Is that what you're? And it, it, it'll explode. You can make a. So oh, I can have exploding what a salt shit. <laughs> and then just summon like a little monkey familiar or something to fling these salt shits. Like, this is oh, already a power more. combo, I'm, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. That's what. Sam, did you disappear? Let, let's see if he comes back. <laughs> there he is. Welcome back. Died. No, it was you, man. I don't know, man. It seemed like you. <laughs> you you could say that. <laughs> you you were telling us about how these how we could throw shit and then it explodes. <laughs> yeah, basically. And, so does, does the stinky. void one does the void one turn into like a little stinking black hole? I guess so. Yeah, <laughs> I imagine I that would know. be up to the up to the DM. <laughs> There's infinite potential here. Infinite there potential. Is. Like, dude. Then this many, is where this, how many uh, this segment of this conversation gets interesting. Oh, and there's a lot. Uh, I mean, there's. There's one for each kind of method. So, I mean, yeah, that, four, eight, 32, 12, <laughs> I don't know, 16. That could get really dangerous really fast if you had the right combination of uh, methods to detonate. Mm-hmm. And they oh, summon yeah. each other. <laughs> they, they summon each other. So, if you just get like a, one of all the comp, all of the specific ones that you need, and then they just summon more, then like you just have like. You have the perfect martyrdom strategy. Yeah. yeah. Imagine if, like, and they're smart enough, or maybe, you know, certain ones would be smart enough to be like, oh, hey, what if I summon some Earth methods to help me out? Yeah. Or, like, you know, and they start, like, using specific element combinations to fuck your party up. <laughs> like, it almost feels like a. It, it, they almost feel like uh, zerglings, and they're and they're trickster yeah. enough to probably do it too. Like the the way they de- the way it's described, they almost feel like a fantasy elemental based zergling that you could just mm-hmm. summon itself or variations like of itself. I would like if these were like a, a common familiar. I, I think they kind of are, but I don't know how. Uh... I mean, I guess if you flavor an imp. It's more or less the same. I'd say essentially, but as I understand in like base D and D lore wise, a lot of wizards tend to use them for uh, various things. Yeah, well, 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 elemental wise, these are a good stepping stone into that kind of messing with the planes, dealing with that energy kind of thing. Right. Yeah, and so you know detonating yourself if you screw it up you can use one of them to, <laughs> exactly. to detonate no that's but, how it works but yeah here is where the fun <laughs> part of this conversation i feel you know where we talk about could you take one of these guys in a fight these guys pull up start doing their fey fuckery in your house and you gotta <laughs> you gotta enact your what is it the second amendment stand your ground law and you gotta put those hands you know <laughs> Well, they explode, so I don't think I'm going to have to worry about getting rid of a body. So I think it dep- oh, yeah, yeah, I think it depends on what kind of mess we we're dealing with, right? Like, like you're in Maine, or I so I imagine maybe like an ice or some air ones or something. Yeah, uh, I would imagine that most methods, short of a magma or fire method, 
wouldn't be that big of an issue yeah, for me. It would be like air, earth, water. It's a pretty yeah, basic like, one. A, a vast majority would not be an issue. Just like, I, I think if I had to fight a magma method, like all of a sudden my ability to punch it is significantly diminished there. <laughs> right off the bat. But um, I think the important thing to remember here, strong. at four foot, you know, they're the perfect punch in height. <laughs> uh, I would say for an IRL fight score, uh, uh, yeah, I think I'm going to give this a, a a two out of uh, ten. I can definitely take one of these things. A as a dad, I throw children on a regular basis. That are already <laughs> a lot of experience. Yes. So I, I have throwing experience. Now, they have wings. So what you got to do is like when you throw them, you have to kind of like uh, get your thumbs like right up under the crease of the wing as you're throwing them so that they can't. Yeah. <laughs> Having been regularly tackled by a gaggle of children, <laughs> I, I can safely say that I could take at least a couple of these things. Because <laughs> that's the thing with methods. They can summon more. So there's never just one unless there is. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, if it was, like, real tiny, then that becomes a problem real quick. Oh, what do you think, Dan? Could could you uh, take a bunch of these things in a fight? I'd have to say yes, because I mean, I I used to play soccer and stuff like that. A good kick. <laughs> I yeah, mean, there you go. It, it might like, explode on you. Is but not that high. That that's what ca that's what you wear combat boots for. They're steel toed. They're leather. Mm. They're heat resistant. You know, just make sure you're in an open field so you can run the other way when they do explode. Yeah. yeah. I could see the steam one might be considered intangible. Yeah, that might be a tricky one. Well, if I'm tackling one of these things in my house, like, I'll just take, I will just rush to my refrigerator and take, like, a whole bucket of ice out of it and just, like, <laughs> right at it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'll hit the water one with the salt one. <laughs> it's a self-solving problem. <laughs> That's when that uh, elementary school uh, chemistry class comes in handy. Oh water and fire don't mix. It's like that game on your phone. <laughs> yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. That that's good. Oh, how much damage do they explode for? Because I think that's the, the main thing. Like, yes, I can kill this thing, but how well am I surviving the uh, aftermath of killing one of these things? Like, I'm assuming that uh, my biggest weapon here is throwing them and hoping that that's the final blow and I'll be far enough away. But, like... Like, that, that's the main question, because, like, general you'll probably see an air and earth and air you know in this scenario so 2d6 of bludgeoning damage for the okay first one. you know 11 strength 13 dex 14 constitution 11 wisdom 14 charisma for the air one looks like 11 for strength 17 for dex 10 right. constitution 6 for intelligence you know pretty 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 good and this one looks like it'd be uh, burst of wind within five feet. Must succeed in a DC 11 deck save or take 1d4 bludgeoning damage. So as long as you're not a wizard, you're fine. Yeah. yeah like, so the earth I, I already got those more dad damage. reflexes. So I, think I'm clear. Uh, like, I, I can mitigate most of the damages here. It's a short little air. No, it's, <laughs> it's like getting hit by an air compressor. <laughs> well, I've had to deal with enough of that, so I think I'll be set. <laughs> I, think I, can <laughs> I think the Earth one would be almost like getting hit by an Earth uh, by a, a dirt clot, yeah. like a whole bunch. Like of rocks. Rock. Yeah, <laughs> someone throws in like a rocket. 
Yeah, just like someone just throws a bag of hammers. <laughs> <laughs> how much? How much do you think two d six of damage would do like in real life? Two d six. I would say that's like okay. So one d six is just like a standard, like a you know, like someone takes a club to you, or like a baseball bat, or like a little yeah. one handed sword. Mm-hmm. Then so I. Uh, I'd say that's the equivalent of like maybe like a sledgehammer. I I would probably say almost like I think the one d six is like getting hit by like what you said like by being hit by a bat by someone who isn't trained like isn't a baseball player. I think the two d six. I think you're talking like minor league baseball player (laughs) swinging a bat. Yeah, that, and that's where things get a little bit bigger. I mean, like a two d six is like okay. Uh, we we decided to get rid of the bat, and uh, is that a fucking Japanese kanabo? What the fuck? <laughs> and they're just like, okay, yeah, giant spiked great. Club. Oh my god, he's got a chair. <laughs> like two uh, d six is when you're getting into yeah, that's absolutely breaking a bone territory. That's mm-hmm. funny. Yeah, like, okay, you'll probably cool. survive it, but you're you're probably gonna hear some cracking yeah one I, I imagine the normal person's constitution is probably like 12 right mm-hmm. Dude, mine's a nine i'm diabetic <laughs> yeah, mine's probably like a 10 I don't know. <laughs> the average person would be 10 or 11 roughly i think the most yeah. most people could take a stabbing you know at least <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know if that's controversial to say but like uh, you know, there's probably some crime statistics on that. We'll talk to the FBI, <laughs> see how many people survive getting stabbed, uh, uh, calculate a, the damages. Is a dagger like a D6 or something? <laughs> like, Doesn't it depend on the dagger? That is true. Hmm. Yeah. And then there's a bunch of, like, sneak attack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, like, a, a standard dagger, you know, like, it's just a, that's yeah, just a knife. You know, <laughs> for most people, one stabbing isn't going to do you in. Unless they get, you know, a good stab in place. Yeah. Unless they roll the crit on you. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I, I would say that's probably true most of the time. And then, and then like 2d6 is what, like two daggers? Like two stabs? <laughs> you just got me thinking, like, how much... If, 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 psych- if, if, if some uh, dude, Psycho X, shows up and stabs him 57 <laughs> times, like, how much damage is that? This is, this is what I'm saying, is everything can be counted in stab. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, like, 50 stab... Okay, that's 50 wounds. Okay, that's a bunch of stabs. And then Assume that she's got a plus one, so that's... Uh, at least a hundred plus damage, bare minimum. So, uh, oh my god! <laughs> I like, think then you would. Ha- I think you would have to start getting into like the lancers' uh, damage protocol, where it's like you have <laughs> zones, and depending on where you get hit, <laughs> is the damage ratio. Because if you get stabbed in the arm, that's not like getting stabbed in the that's stomach. Exactly. Yeah, that, that, that is Wait, very you... <laughs> fundamentally different. And have it's like, okay, if you get stabbed in the stomach, like uh, maybe if you're lucky, like it'll miss certain organs. But there's a lot of organs in there. There's yeah, or just a bag of meat. Yeah. <laughs> like, have you? Wait, have you guys? <laughs> You guys seen that movie um, with Justin Timberlake uh, called In Time? No. We're, okay, no. so okay, so there's a Justin Timberlake movie, and like they they have like their lifespans, you know, spelled out in like times on their wrists. Oh, and I do know that. At one. the same time, it's like their currency, you know. So all so that kind of like directly tells them how long until they die. And it's also like how wealthy they are. Okay. You know? So it's like it's like that idea, but with tapping. That sounds like a fantastic <laughs> setting for a, for a campaign, though. Like I, you could run some shadow run in a setting like that. Yeah, your body will auto heal you for that many stats. <laughs> you gotta you gotta pay for everything that you I feel like for something like that you basically just give them a maximum HP and then you have to chip backwards so basically there is no healing it's just oh yeah true yeah like yeah oh. that would be the easiest way as a GM oh, to do God. it is max go okay I you gotta know. go grab the water I'll be right back yep yeah, so your HP is on a time allotment, and it's mm-hmm. ticking down, and yep. every time you take damage, that's coming out of the chunk. So it's like, 
that's actually a really fun way to look at that. And I feel like it that could would be, be a really great one shot. It'd make a fun campaign because your, your players are running against the clock to replenish HP. Mm-hmm. And they got to go on uh, missions to be like, okay, th- this mission is going to give us more HP. So mm-hmm. you don't have to have anyone be the healer. The goal is to complete the job to get healed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that would be one way to do it. I think there's a lot of potential for that. That'd be really interesting. I'm, I'm going to have to write that down. <laughs> That's why I keep a oh, little bit. Hey, I do have paper. paper. Yeah, I always keep some next to me when I do this show. Like Every time that I haven't, it's like, ah, those ideas were too good. I, I can see why some people run like multiple campaigns a week, honestly, just because like too many good ideas to just let them go to waste. Yeah. All right, I'm back. <laughs> Welcome okay. back, Sam. Ugh, my throat is moist again. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that I had to do like recording for an uh, for that audio book today, and like, dude, you try recording for an audio book and just not have water nearby. Like, if if you don't keep your mouth all like wet and moist for it, like you get all these clickety sounds, and it's just disgusting the audio is just disgusting to nobody listen. wants to hear your mouth noises <laughs> the mouth noises are the worst <laughs> absolutely but all right sam are you ready for the homebrews this week i am i am go into the generic realm generic realm fun in the generic realms and this week uh, i'd like to just to take point sam because i present to you in the theme of anime inspired stuff oh yeah this is something that is brought to us by let's see what was the reddit user's name here oh oh, come on The, the page doesn't want to show me but anyway uh it's gotta be on here somewhere Regardless, the Nichiren sword uh, from uh, Demon Slayer. I'm sure you're both at least like passively familiar with Demon Slayer. You know, I do like Demon Slayer. Yes, I'm passively on it. You've you've probably seen like a thing or two. Like it kind of broke the Internet that one time when everyone's Mm -hmm. like, oh, this animation looks really great. And then and then for the years afterward everyone's like wow this this show's really mid it's really carried by its animation as if it's a bad thing <laughs> but these uh nichiren weapons they're specially made and once you attune to them like uh, let me just uh, kind of read it off here the, it can be any melee weapon and they they have different uh rarities uncommon rare plus one very rare plus two plus three for legendary and when you attune to a nichiren weapon for the first time you gain one inspiration then choose a color from the table below all nichiren weapons attuned uh, you attune to become that color Additionally, once per long rest, when you hit a creature with a melee weapon attack, you may expend an inspiration to deal an additional 3d8 of the weapon's uh, damage type. Mm. That's already interesting. Mm -hmm. And once per week, when you perform a great deed that corresponds to the color of your weapon, you may gain one inspiration. Okay. So already off to a fun start. Different ways to spend inspiration. Because, like, uh, most people forget to even run inspiration in, in their campaigns. I, I've met plenty of DMs that's like, what, inspiration? For, you, you guys don't need that. For true. But this, like, it really incentivizes it to be more than just a, hey, let's re-roll a thing. And underneath all of this, let's see here. For the colors, there's black, lavender, blue, red, yellow, green, indigo, purple, pink, amber, indigo gray and white and each of those corresponds with a certain deed such such as uh perseverance responsibility courage restraint faith patience humility confidence mercy empathy so 
each of these can be like it's very flavorful in that it reflects on the on the character themselves like if they're trying to embody something then this will be very reflected in how they role play overall as far as weapons go it can be really anything and not too impressive not game breaking by any means just like a little bit extra for dms that want to give magic magical ish weapons to their players without it being too much early on that is true yeah i like i always liked what the swords represented in demon slayer too yeah i always thought it was neat like uh, when someone gets their weapon they're like oh hey uh, it, it just changes a certain color to reflect the personality Yeah, I feel like something like that would give more tenants to seeing people role play a little bit more too. It does, because, yeah. Down at the bottom, where it talks about uh, choosing a color. Yeah, because then it it gives the the player something to connect with with their character, which gives them more connections and gives them that that drive to make their character more than just a you know generic hero five. Exactly. 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 And then honestly, the whole once per week when you perform a great deed that corresponds with the color of your weapon, you gain an extra inspiration. Like, that's really nice. Like, say you want to go like a more like a paladin or something and you're practicing mercy. Okay, you have this big purple great sword and it's like, I'm I'm a stay my hand this time. I won't kill this. Uh, well, just she's the sword. Boom. Inspiration. That's role play right there. No, it yeah. says you should choose a color that will challenge your character in some way. Hmm. So, yeah, like, but a, Mer- no, go ahead. Uh, no, no, you're good. Mercy for paladins is actually harder than people think because a lot of people view paladins as the um, destroy all the evil. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things uh, we had a paladin in our season one that had that mentality of like his goal was to destroy all the evil. And I actually made other paladins that have the you can't destroy the evil. You have to temper that evil. Like imagine you have a paladin hmm. in the kitchen. Yes. For the, for the restraint. Hmm. You know? Yeah. yeah, like maybe if you're playing a vengeance paladin and they end up with the purple, so like okay, the mercy, like mercy. oh, you're, you're on your mm-hmm. quest for vengeance, but like you need to learn patience to... or responsibility. Oh, this could be... <laughs> hold See? on, this could cook. <laughs> this is a this is a item that is built for character development, and I think that it'd be very good for like if you award this to a player, just like hey, work with them a little bit. Like what aspect that could really challenge your character and i've noticed these traits you know the other way to do you what you could do is um start it out as a cursed item Ooh. have the care have the player build a character and then give them the sword that is the opposite of their character and it is a cursed sword hmm. so if they want to make like like you could do this as an evil campaign, have a yeah. whole like r- conversion back to neutral to good. Just this hmm. evil character has this weapon now. And if they want to get stronger with it, they have to start fighting their instincts and that evil side of them. I think that's fantastic. Cause that's one of those things where it, takes the concept and turns it on its head where a cursed item isn't necessarily cursed in the way that you think Mm -hmm. that could be a lot of fun to run yeah all right sam what do you got this week ah snail house okay I, i'm already sold i've been big on snails since we got <laughs> doing our whole one piece uh, situation <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
we have shown some of uh, Catalyst's work before. <laughs> and it's always a pleasure to go over this stuff. and items brought inside the house are infected when they help them grow. So this is a wondrous item classified as a rare. The magical residence can house four medium or smaller creatures in mind of what form. The interior is magically cozy and features flame that smokes when it burns. It houses a bathroom, a toilet, and a living an open living room and a kitchen area. Creatures in the area where the portable snail health appears are what the DC controls have carried and carried away, taking 4d10 bludgeoning damage if they fail to save or half as much on success. In either case, the creatures are pushed with an unmodified state outside the next state. So you could throw these. <laughs> I personally like it just for the sheer fact of I like giving the players a home, you know, just yeah, camping too. is great and all if you have a party that's built for it. Like I've had parties that get all gung ho where it's like, we got mold earth, we can make camp, yeah, you know, kind of real, real good in my you're very like, hey, we climb into the cliff side and make a little cave. Yeah, yeah we, we make a cave or we, and then we just put together a little stone door, a little eye hole, so people can't literally like get in on us. So, you know, keeping watch was made a whole lot easier that way. Yeah. You guys had many familiars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would even say too many. It, it was a lot. I don't know how you did it. It was fun. <laughs> Give me like a Pokemon ride. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's always like Pokemon in the Grim Hollows. <laughs> want a Digimon D&D &D so bad. <laughs> That'd be a fun Isekai style yeah, campaign. D &D. Like, <laughs> like maybe if you kind of combine the whole Stipples thing with yeah. something a little grittier, like... Uh... Give them like evolutions. That'd be crazy. Yeah, like... I mean, <laughs> you could probably sit and go through the monster manuals and work backwards, find something where you want it to end and then figure out what goes to where i mean look at pokemon you got magikarp to gyarados gyarados thank you my brain yeah. blanked there's a big jump between the two that, that I mean, really is and flavoring it easy enough the stat blocks mm -hmm. like it's just a matter of okay from here to here to here like you said mm -hmm. you know what? i mean i feel like i know the digimon evolution system well enough i probably could yeah <laughs> I mean, the, the thing I liked about, like, the Digimon stuff is you could go multiple ways with all the different types. Oh, like, they oh, weren't yeah. just a – where Pokemon tended to be A to B to C, unless it was no, Eevee, true. that you had the split. Digimon had the – everything had three forms or four forms, but there were branching within. Yeah, it was like so, a tree for all yeah. of them. I feel like that would be a fun way because then you could, depending on how you level them – the, the familiars you could then go which way so if you wanted something that was spec melee it would be easier to do mm -hmm. oh that's cool apparently the there are some D, D style digimon campaigns that oh, yeah. people have done for like actual plays hmm do that. somebody I mean, should uh come Digi into destiny our uh, should come into digimon our discord in front of okay we should get some of these guys on the show that sounds interesting you should absolutely because I want to play in one. <laughs> <laughs> we'll That's really cool. It as a as a thing on our on our, on our stuff. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Wink wonk. Anyway, wonk. yeah, I like that house. <laughs> <laughs> I also like that you could throw it and do you know potentially forty bludgeoning damage. <laughs> like, yeah. You're going to break your house just to kill a boss. <laughs> that gives me yeah. Wicked Witch of the West, West vibes right there. <laughs> it, it, it's a classic maneuver, really. Mm -hmm. Oh, damn. 
but a snail though like i i just like the the general flavor and shape it's just like just yeah, i imagine you could you know you could paint the you paint the little snail to look like whatever you want you know you could get it customized <laughs> you know uh, not enough players utilize paint in campaigns so <laughs> you know <laughs> if someone wants to go that route all by all means dude so I imagine, means. you know, like the barbarian finds this, maybe it's like a rock or, or like a crystal or something mm-hmm. or like a, you know, yeah. and then maybe the druid find one, maybe it's a snail or. Okay. So like kind of flavor it up according to like who yeah. finds it. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Shout out to That'd Catalyst cool. for uh, putting together another neat homebrew. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, yeah, I think that about sums up everything we've got. (laughs) I I suppose so. Is there anything that you'd like to uh, leave the uh, listeners and audience with before we uh, call it good for the night? Me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. (laughs) Um well, speaking of homebrew, one of the things that I'm doing for our season two, which is so far I haven't found a lot of and a lot of people in the Shadowrun community that I've been talking to are actually really excited for is if you know anything about Shadowrun, it is always ran on Earth, uh, 2050s, 2055s, depending on right. the book you're using. And it's always ran in Seattle. It's just part of the world and everything. Seattle, Yeah, Seattle. But, um, so bizarre to me. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a lore reason. There's a lot of reasons why. Uh, it's just the way they did it. So for our season two, I have completely rebuilt the world. We okay. are playing Shadowrun 5th edition in Niratova with an 100% homebrewed world with 100% homebrewed cities. Uh, we are also playing it a little differently. Usually when you play a runner, the world has already kind of gotten into this like decrepit grunge kind of like dystopian world we're actually the city that we're starting in is called the golden city and it is actually okay. more utopian and during the season we're actually going to get the chance to watch it fall like it you're oh, going to see awesome. that dystopian come in mm-hmm. i have spent the last year writing an entire lore book for our show mixing homebrewed information and history like i have written history history and the vanilla and i have actually taken great strides into blending it all to be very organic um yeah that sounds really cool it's been a task Uh, we have imagine like i did something almost similar to that where i was just kind of like composing the setting for a campaign that i want to run Mm -hmm. and it's just like like you said, just kind of bastardizing some stuff and like making mm-hmm. it your own, but making it work organically. Yeah. And it's just like, I, it, it's so much that goes into it that I, I couldn't yeah. possibly release that yet. Yeah. So we're doing that. So not only do I have the homebrew world, but we have, we're introducing two mega corporations, three, two shadow governments, as well as some other stuff that's going on that I can't reveal because it is actually like going to show up in the show, and I don't want to give spoilers. Ah, yeah. Um, it is, that check us out, they'll know. <laughs> yeah, um, but we, I don't have an exact release date yet, but I do know that season two should be dropping late July, early June is when we're going to be starting that season. I don't have an exact date yet. Oh yeah! Shout out to you guys. Uh, well, sounds this really sounds fun. really interesting, and honestly, like I'm excited to just check it out because it just seems like you got a lot cooked up for all this story stuff. Mm-hmm. And I'm getting almost I'm almost done with the current uh, podcast I'm listening to. Yeah, I, I only juggle like one D and D podcast at a time nowadays. I oh man I I'm at the point where practically every week I've got something new to listen to I've got between Shadowrun Starfinder and D and D Pathfinder I I have a pretty big collection of stuff I listen to and it's amazing because I'm listening to some of them and some of them are bringing back their old GMs and I'm like I remember this GM I loved this GM and I get mm. to hear their stories again. 
I love how diverse everything is. Like there's all there's every possible flavor for these mm-hmm. uh, D and D uh, type stuff. Like all these uh, tabletop podcasts. It's just all across the the spectrum. Like we we had mm-hmm. a guy that does a Doctor Who podcast. Oh wow! Oh yeah, yeah. That- we've I love that we've met so many different kinds of people. Yeah, that- and like. All the different countries and you know nationalities. It's been so fun seeing how far this community reaches. Yeah, it's since we've been doing this. I uh, I used to listen. Like I watched a lot of British TV growing up because you know mm. I was a '90s kid and you know Monty Python was a thing. Right. Uh, and ne- listening to some of these guys that are podcasts that are from overseas, I'm just like. This is amazing. Like they tell stories vastly different. The yeah, way yeah. they orchestrate everything is very different. <laughs> we can only hope half as memorable as them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing that we're doing for season two is we're actually doing collabs. Uh, we're bringing in people from other TTRPGs, not just Shadowrun, but I have. Um, Bunkers and badasses. I've got a couple of. I've gotten Riley from. Uh, crap. What show is he in? Hold on. Friend and foe adventure co. I had him come in. Um, I have had D and other D and D podcast Pathfinder, other Shadow Runners, and even a couple that are just you know Twitch streamers that have joined us. Uh, we have our first ten episodes are all collabs. That's awesome. So my entire season two, I have a bunch of episodes that I'm going to be planning that are a collab. Some of them are podcast specific. Like I I'm tailoring them for them. And then I have ones that are going to be open cast calls and it's like four hours. You get a taste of Shadowrun, and you get to, to get into four episodes, five episodes, depending on the recording. Nice. Well, uh, so how, how I've been doing it is I will either do – we actually – on our Discord, we have a podcasters-only tab, uh, which yeah. were actually podcasters, streamers, creative types. Um, yeah. There's a private channel for them. And whenever I'm doing a collab, I post in there first. And then if I don't get any responses or if I don't have any that are available, I – reach out to individuals or I will actually just post on Twitter or uh, blue sky, which I need to get better at doing blue sky because that is a, another social media I need to do. Yeah. I feel like... mm-hmm. Oh god. It's I, I guess that is a good one. Yeah, I mean I guess it's because I'm I've been prepping for uh star, for Shadowrun. Right. Disabilities are a thing in that world still. Like even yeah. though they're cybernetics, you have something called cyber reje- cyber rejection syndrome, which means yeah. cyber technology doesn't work in your body. So you still have people in wheelchairs and things like that. And it, it's, I don't know. Like I Look, I, I will say, you know, let's let our listeners leave it in our comments. Let us know what they think. Yeah. You, how, what do you guys feel about this topic? You know, I guess. But I think that's pretty much all we have to <laughs> say. I mean, like, yeah. all, all I'm at is just like, it, it's, if, it, if it's fun, run it. But mm-hmm. don't, you cannot get mad. I mean, <laughs> it's weird. all hostile architecture. It's not safe for anybody to go in there to begin with. It's not targeted, I promise. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, all right, hit us with the closer. We do kind of, yeah, kind of. I thought I was axed or something now. No, no, 
No, I don't care what anyone says. It's the Twitterverse for me. It's, it's... Yeah. Yeah, we all know it's Twitter. Hope you enjoy. We love you. Enjoy April and your March or whatever month it is. <laughs> bye bye. Yeah.